Brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. Well, the Catholic world is warily waiting for some secular news to come out of the imperial capital. Many of us are watching the imperial capital's archbishop to see what he will do with his rumored implementation of Traditionis Custodis. And this gives us an opportunity to talk about the likely consequences of his implementing Traditionis Custodis in a way that most of us expect he will, with a cruelty only rivaled by that of Francis himself. There will be consequences to trying to crush the Latin Mass. So let's talk about what they are today because they're very real and it's going to come to pretty much every diocese that else that pr tried to implement Traditionis Custodis. So let's talk about this now. But first, as we like to do from time to time, let's check in with Paca Papa Francis, who gives us a good way to kick off this discussion by looking at something he told some priests in Italy about how he wants to free the laity from pious superstition. Yes, the man the world thinks is Pope said that. According to Gloria TV, quote, Francis is quote unquote worried about the alleged reforms the Vatican II wanted. He told bishops and priests from Sicily on June 9th, saying that he wants to free popular piety from, a piety from allegedly superstitious gestures. He criticized sermons where people go out for a break, although such people have stopped going to church decades ago, of course, says the original author of this piece. Sermons about everything and nothing without substance, like his own. The core of Francis's address was about how to preside the liturgy. Still the lace, where are we? 60 years after the council, a little updating also in liturgical art, in liturgical fashion. Yes, sometimes bringing some of grandma's lace goes, but only sometimes. This is to, to pay homage to the grandmother, no? Francis showed himself an unhealthy obsession with liturgical paraphernalia. Francis added that insularity should not impede the true liturgical reform that the council set forth, while Francis himself is resurrecting in the Vatican the tastelessness and liturgical wars of 60 years ago, end quote. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I love the editorializing that they do over Gloria TV. But this was quite edifying for Francis, wasn't it? Nothing inspires confidence in the validity of a papacy quite like the man the world presumes as pontiff saying garbage like that. But it really does set the stage for what we need to talk about today. Francis is waging a war against sacred tradition. That much is obvious. By his own words, he says he's doing it at least in part to free the church from pious superstition, which apparently characterized the church in the years before the council. But this does beg a question. What will the consequences be of his war on tradition? At least in the short term, since we know that the forces of Satan will lose this conflict. A writer over at Pillar Catholic asked this question, and they provided some interesting information about what is likely to happen. In short, we can expect to see parish closures. More than the modernists think. Headline, are U.S. dioceses in a corner over Traditionis Custodis? It's been a year since Traditionis Custodis was released. Numerous dioceses have implemented it. A few have basically ignored it, but most have done something with it. The Diocese of Washington, D.C., headed by Cardinal Wilton Gregory of the James Martin Fan Club, is apparently going to release his own severe restrictions on the Apostolic Mass shortly if the reports from numerous priests in that diocese are to be taken at face value, and I have every reason to believe that they should be. But there are challenges to this, including making numerous Catholics without a home in the church. From the article, quote, a challenge is illustrated in the Archdiocese of Washington. Several priests of the Archdiocese told the pillar this week that Cardinal Wilton Gregory approved a plan for the implementation of Traditionis Custodis in the Archdiocese weeks ago, but has not yet released the policy. Everyone knows the broad brush strokes at this point, one senior diocesan cleric told the pillar. We're all just kind of waiting for the big reveal, or the hammer to fall, depending on your point of view. The priest, along with several other diocesan clerics, agreed to speak with the pillar on condition of anonymity, citing archdiocesan policy to refer all media contact to the chancery. Several senior clergy told the pillar that the plan, approved by Cardinal Gregory, but as yet unpublished, will effectively prohibit the celebration of the extraordinary form of the Mass in any archdiocesan or parish church, but would allow for a single weekly celebration at a church on the grounds of the Franciscan Monastery in the D.C. neighborhood of Brooklyn. The Cardinal has been clear, we are going to do what the Pope asks, another Washington priest told the pillar. That means no extraordinary form mass in parish churches. The text is not yet released. 
One source close to the chancery attributed the delay to Gregory's commitment to hearing feedback on the issue from both the priests of the archdiocese and from the local Catholic community through the archdiocesan synodal listening sessions, which concluded at the end of May. The results of those sessions are being drawn up now, though it is unclear to what extent their conclusions should alter the archdiocesan plans, end quote. Honestly, these listening sessions were probably for show. Gregory will act in the same way his friend Cardinal Supich did. He will all but eliminate the apostolic mass from his diocese, relegating it to a single building in the entire archdiocese, and reports are it's going to be a monastic community that he's going to. And monasteries can't offer all of the sacraments. So it's a good strategy if you're trying to crush the traditional form of the sacraments as well. And it's to be expected. But what about the fallout from this action? At the listening sessions that he attended, he was begged by parishioners not to take their parishes from them. I sincerely doubt he'll listen, but the data is interesting nonetheless, as it gives us an idea about what the consequences could be from this action. Quote, of course, the overall number of Catholics attending the extraordinary form is small, but it is also concentrated in some parish communities which have come to depend on it. Weekly attendance numbers suggest that some parishes like St. Francis might struggle to remain viable if the extraordinary form is excised from the parish. It's ironic, really, one archdiocesan priest who does not offer the extraordinary form of the mass in his parish told the pillar. The rationale is that traditionis requires the old mass not be celebrated in parish churches, but closing the old mass in some of these places will effectively close the parish too. What community is that supposed to serve exactly? All the clergy of the diocese know this will be the effect. No one sees the need or the benefit, pastorally speaking, but I don't think any amount of listening and reflection is going to move the needle. One priest close to the archdiocese and chancery told the pillar that Washington and Cardinal Gregory are in a corner over implementing traditionis custodis. It's the capital. There's a small but very vocal, very visible traditional liturgy community here, and everyone is watching, he said. I think the cardinal is in a corner. What's he to do? Implement anything less than the letter of the law, and it will look like you are ignoring the pope and setting an example for others to do the same. Do without listening to your own clergy and people in the synodal sessions, and you're being unpastoral and not following the Pope's lead either. What happens if the results of the synodal listening sessions and the advice of the archdiocesan clergy point towards a more moderate implementation of traditionis custodis? There may be no easy answer for Cardinal Gregory or for bishops in other dioceses facing a similar choice. End quote. This assumes that Gregory cares about being pastoral, or pastoral with traditional Catholics at any rate. I'm banking on him being more concerned with being a good Francis loyalist than he is about being pastoral. He will implement this policy, and he'll do it soon. I almost expect him to do it when the court releases its ruling on the big case everyone is waiting with bated breath on, just so Catholic media doesn't pick up on it as much as we should. But fear not, I will report on it as soon as it's released. But there's another reason that Gregory will almost certainly implement traditionus custodis as required by Francis. Fear. Fear of Francis. As Damian Thompson tells us in his recent piece over at unheard.com, Francis isn't exactly a nice man. He begins by the recent rumors of his allegedly impending resignation, and then he mostly debunks those rumors. From Mr. Thompson's article, quote, The one thing that the two rumors have in common is that no one has produced a shred of evidence to back them up. On Tuesday, the Washington Post quoted a senior Vatican official speaking on the condition of anonymity to discuss a sensitive issue, i.e. Francis's health. He said, his situation isn't brilliant, but it's not enough to impose a resignation. However, in the same article, Massimo Fascioli, a professor of theology at Villanova University, Philadelphia, said that, what is clear is that his pontificate has entered his declining final stage. He is aware that he is approaching the end of his pontificate. That's interesting because Fascioli is an uber loyalist. He's one of the founding members of Team Francis, a group of journalists and other commentators whose near deification of this pope wouldn't be out of place in North Korea. Fascioli has made a career out of his laudatory analysis of Francis. Many Catholics on Twitter tease him for it, at which point, and I speak from experience, he immediately blocks them. Declining final stage. Francis doesn't look like he's dying. He's just a fat man in a wheelchair. There's nothing wrong with his faculties. He continues to charm visitors, and when it comes to internal church politics, he's more vindictive than ever. Giving a red hat to the Archbishop Robert McElroy or McElroy of San Diego, a hardline liberal who favors giving communion to Moloch serving politicians, was a masterstroke of revenge against Francis's least favorite people in the world, 
American conservative bishops. Team Francis aren't popular in Rome these days. The best kept secret of his pontificate, at least to the general public, is concerned, is that Jorge Bergoglio is not, and never has been, a nice man. He made so many enemies in Argentina that he hasn't dared set foot in his native country since being elevated to the papacy. He was involved in some jaw-dropping scandals there. Most shockingly, his attempts to protect his Ted McCarrick type priest ally, Father Julio Garassi, from justice. He's lucky that the Vatican press corps is too afraid of him to investigate them properly. Francis has a streak of cruelty in him, and recently he's done little to hide it. Last year's authoritarian attempt to crush regular celebrations of the traditional Latin Mass offended hundreds of bishops who don't like that style of worship, but dislike the Argentinian pontiff even more. They have quietly ignored the ruling. Much to the fury of the papal liturgy chief, a painfully self-important Yorkshireman called Arthur Roach, who will be made a cardinal in August. End lengthy quote. Francis is not light, but he is feared due to his cruelty. Do you remember Bishop Torres of Puerto Rico? He was summarily stripped of his office in a way that was in clear violation of canon law. No one will hear his case in Rome. And Francis almost certainly isn't going to either. What was, Fran what was Torres's undoing? It was not falling in line with the rest of the bishops of Puerto Rico and implementing Traditionis Custodis fully and not sending his seminarians to the single modernist seminary in Puerto Rico. There were other issues too, touching on the relationship between the secular world and the church in 2020 that Taurus was on the right side of, meaning not on Francis' side, and all of those things led to his dismissal. That dismissal looms large over this and every bishop in the church is well aware of what happened to Bishop Torres. So while Cardinal Gregory almost certainly agrees with most of what Francis wants, and while he may also not want to inflict suffering on his diocese, there should be no doubt they will do so both out of loyalty to and fear of Francis. Now, what do you think? Am I right? Is Damien Thompson correct in all this? Is Francis known for his cruelty? Let me know what you think about this in the comments, please. And if you think, well, if we're being sinfully critical of Francis, let me know that too, if that's what you think. Personally, I think we're all just saying what is obviously true for anyone who has eyes to see and ears to hear if they've been paying attention. It may be wrong, so let me know in the comments what you think of all of this. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.